Happy Earth Day. <laughs> My name's Amy McDonald. I'm the director of City Space, and this is our way of celebrating Earth Day. Um, this, it, we've had, it's a culmination of a week's long events that we've had here in City Space leading up to leading up to this day. So we are so excited to be presenting the Multiverse Concert Series with Climate Hope Concert. You're in for a real treat. This is unique. Welcome. Hello and welcome to Climate Hope Concert, a gathering of musicians, artists, scientists and activists on a theme of climate change and finding rational hope in our moment and a way forward together. My name's David Ibbett, I'm the director of Multiverse Concert Series and I'm here with Mike Block, our solo cellist, visuals by Nuzu Wong and a host of guest speakers who are joining us for the concert. Our next piece is called 10,000 Rays of Hope.
<laughs> Let's give it up for Mike Block, everybody. That, that featured the research of the Monet Polymer Project, which are based here at MIT uh, and in Duke and, in fact, around the country. Okay, so we give Mike a little break for a second, and we move on to the first of our guest speakers. It is my great pleasure to introduce Patricia Spence of the Urban Farming Institute. How's everybody doing? Oh, good to hear, good to hear. Urban farming is wonderful for our earth and great for our communities. Urban farms are exceptional places for healing and well-being. More farms equal more local fresh food, less heat islands, lower transportation costs, regeneration of green spaces, fewer water resources, intensive farming with high yields, for our neighbors and our families. Our mission at the Urban Farming Institute is to develop and promote urban farming to engage our residents in growing food and building a healthier community. Our communities of color suffer from some of the highest rates of obesity, heart disease, diabetes. We often, act lack, often lack access to fresh food, economic opportunities, housing, and environmental justice. But those neighborhoods of Roxbury, Dorchester, and Mattapan are vibrant places filled with wonderful families, brilliant children, innovative teenagers, savvy seniors, budding entrepreneurs, movers and shakers, and a type of resiliency that is simply astounding. That is the community that we work with. Many of our board and staff members have been thought leaders in the development of commercial urban farming in Boston and beyond. Next slide. Our headquarters is located at the historic Fowler-Clark Epstein Farm in Mattapan. 200 years ago, owned by the Fowler family, it was a 330-acre farm. Now it's less than an acre, and our neighbors all around us hail from Jamaica, Haiti, Puerto Rico, Dominica, Nigeria, Barbados, and more. Next slide. UFI has key, four key areas, land, farm operations, farmer training, and education. And it all started when one of our founders, wondered why he had to pass by vacant lots in Roxbury and then order fresh salad greens from California for his food business in Roxbury. Why couldn't, we, why couldn't these lots be transformed into productive farm sites servicing our families and local businesses? Places where youth, adults, families, teens, and the little babies can all learn how to grow food and build farms and gardens. The precursor to the Astoria Quarter Acre Farm was a day-long event where we shared with the community how we all could build a farm in just one day. Forty people showed up from all walks of life to help out. We built 16 raised beds and harvested from the site all summer long. Here is the next iteration of that, next, that site. And here are our wonderful farmer trainees from the farmer training program that summer, harvesting by the end of that summer. We are pleased to announce that we've created a separate nonprofit, the Boston Farms Community Land Trust, so land will be acquired, developed, and held in perpetuity for all of our budding urban farmers. UFI has six active farm sites nestled into Dorchester and Mattapan, 50 crops, 100 varieties of vegetables and herbs. We grew about 16,500 pounds of food uh, last year. And it was during a summer, as you all recall, with high, high temperatures and so little natural rainfall. Urban farming allows for the growing of specialty crops such as callaloo, you might not know all of these, kooza squash, okra, scotch bonnet, collard greens. We grow what the people want in our communities. UFI has its own site, of, own site, at our own site, a state-of-the-art greenhouse. We grow ginger and turmeric, and we will host our May 13th annual seedling sale for our community. Our farmers grow food for multiple CSAs, that's Community Supported Agriculture, and our fabulous Farm Stand Fridays, July through November. Our farm stand is filled with our own veggies, and herbs, and in addition, fruit, corn, apples, with our rural partners. Arts, culture, jazz, and painting will also be prominent this year, driving more and more people to understand urban farming and to purchase fresh local food. 
Excess food is donated to seniors and families each week of the farm stand. A big part of what we do resides in our urban farmer training program for adults. Here are two trainees from the 2021 class. For over 10 years and 285 graduates later, UFI has provided for economic opportunity as we train the next crop of urban farmers. Financial literacy and business planning sessions are all designed to prepare our farmers for positions in the urban farming world. Okay, I just like this picture. <laughs> That's all I got to say. I just thought it was cute. These kids love carrots and apples and tomatoes. So we'll go next. The story of Chris Mables is why we do the work that we do. Chris was in his 30s, unemployed, and had no plan. When Chris graduated in 2014, he said, if it were not for the urban farming program, I have no idea what I'd be doing, and it saved my life. Chris has been gainfully employed ever since then. Grantley was in our first 2013 class, moved on to a health center where he worked, and guess what he did when he got there? He started an urban farm stand operation in their parking lot and had UFI come in as the lead farm stand. Our vision is to have thriving urban farms empowering individuals and communities through access to healthier food, a deeper connection to land and environment, and strong social networks. In the area of education, you can become a volunteer for the day. You can attend workshops such as Growing Food Without a Garden, Food is Medicine, you can learn about composting, our healthy cooking in our teaching kitchen, and if you're a youth from a school, you can come and harvest your own salad greens, make that fresh dressing, make your salad, and then love it. Children are so excited about salad when they create it themselves for all the parents in the room. <laughs> You can join us for our annual Food Day and Garlic Fest in October, where you can make fire cider, learn about food as medicine, plant garlic, and youth learn how to make fresh pressed apple cider. Or if you're a senior, fit around the farm, provides chair yoga, exercise, and cooking tips with guest chefs. The program staves off isolation and promotes good health with new friends. Here is one of our 93-year-old elders growing string beans and basil and tomatoes on her own porch. Okay, news alert, that's my mummy. That's my mummy. The men's gathering is a safe place where our men can gather and have deep private talks about their health, past trauma, and how to uplift other men and families, members along the way. Tai Chi and general fitness for life exercises are part of the program. Many of our seniors come back and volunteer at the Urban Farming Institute and grow their own food. We all must participate in ways to mitigate the effects of climate change. During COVID, UFI started a raised bed program encouraging our families to grow the food that they loved in their backyard, porch, dr or driveway. We've built 122 so far. Next. This raised bed was to help the homeowner teach her grandchildren how to grow fresh food because the the children are our future in this area of climate change. During COVID, UFI kept many families going that did not have access to fresh meals by providing approximately 7,000 meal bags of pre-prepared food. Our headquarters is, lo is located again at the historic Fowler Clark Epstein Farm in Mattapan. After a successful campaign, we plan to purchase our headquarters from historic Boston this summer. UFI will continue to be a hub of urban farming and health and wellness way into the future. In conclusion, over the next 10 years, we will remain thought leaders and innovators in the urban agriculture and environmental justice movement, helping to combat climate change by creating more farms and empowering and teaching more people to repurpose city spaces for growing food. 85% of our farm team are farmer training graduates gainfully employed by UFI. Some might think this is an oasis. These are my string beans in my backyard in Dorchester, just to let you know. My wish, 25 more farms by 2025, because more farms equal more food. UrbanFarmingInstitute.org is our website. Thank you very much. Pivot for Patricia Spence, Urban Farming Institute, 25 more farms by 2025. I'm sure they can do it with our help.
sweet music of the spheres. Have you heard the siren sing, or Orpheus play to hell's black king? If so, be happy and rejoice, for thou hast heard my cry. Let's have a round of applause for the Instile Moderno Ensemble, who performs two songs by Henry Laws. They'll be back later in the show.
theme of corals and coral reefs. It's my great pleasure to introduce our next speakers, Sarah Davies, Dr. Sarah Davies and Dr. Hannah Eichelman of BU Marine Biology. <laughs> Round of applause. Hi everyone, happy Earth Day. I'm really excited to be here and tell you all about my favorite place to be in the whole world, which is right here on a coral reef. I just finished my uh, PhD in Sarah's lab, actually just a month ago, so I'm still not used to being introduced as doctor. I love it. <laughs> um, but this is a really incredible snorkeler's eye view of a coral reef. Um, corals are incredibly complex ecosystems. There's many species that you can see in just this photo here. And corals are complex even on the within individual level. So a coral is 
an animal, a plant, and a rock rolled all into one. Next slide, please. So if you zoom in on coral individuals that you see here, you can tell that corals are animals that have tentacles. They're related to jellyfish. And corals can use these tentacles to catch food out of the water column and eat it. But they also rely on plants that live inside them. These are the photosynthetic algae that take energy from the sun, turn it into sugar, and feed the coral. And in the tropics, in warm water, this is how corals survive. They can't live without their, without their symbiotic algae. But corals are also uh, rocks, and they build skeletons that um, is the home, basically, of the coral. And corals are actually see-through, so when they go through a bleaching event and waters warm up and the corals lose those photosynthetic algae, they turn from brown on the left of this photo here to white because those pigments from the algae are lost and you can see through the, the translucent uh, tissue of the coral animal down into the skeleton that the coral is building. And if the temperatures don't go back to normal, if the stressor isn't relieved quickly enough, bleaching uh, can lead to coral death because corals rely so heavily on the sugars and the food that they're getting from those algae. And unfortunately, reefs today look like this more frequently um, with really massive stands of corals um, entirely bleached and unfortunately on their way to dying. All right, proud, proud moment, Dr. Eichelman. <laughs> um, so I'm Sarah, I run the Davies Marine Population Genomics Lab here at Boston University, which is where we are. Um, so that's my lab there, uh, represented as the little algae. Um, so we're a team of really passionate people who love corals, love algae, and love their skeletons. Um, and we work in, a, in really cool places. Um, so our main two places that we work right now is the Palawan Archipelago on the top, and then Panama, uh, the Caribbean side uh, in, uh, in Panama, in Bocas del Toro, is the specific archipelago that we work on. Uh, next slide. And so we're really interested in understanding and predicting why certain corals bleach and others don't. Um, we're not the only lab to be interested in this, so there's a bunch of teams of people trying to understand these same questions all around the world today. Um, so this is an example of two individuals that are the same species, so they look pretty similar. They're side by side, so living in the same environment, and one is bleached and one is not. And so we're really interested in understanding this sort of variation. Why are two individuals that, are, that belong to the same species, that live in the same environment, why is one bleached and one isn't? We're also really interested in understanding why some coral species are stronger than others. So this is an image of three different coral species where two are bleached and one is not. So we're really interested in understanding that what are the mechanisms that allow organisms like this species on, on y'all's left to keep its relationship with this algae while others don't. Next. Um, and we're also really interested in understanding strong reefs. So understanding how some reefs can go from, in, 20, in 2006, it was a healthy reef. 2010, it was totally dead. 2012, we start seeing recruitment or coming back of the reef. And then by 2014, it looks really good. So why do some reefs bounce back like this and other reefs don't? Next. Um, so nothing is guaranteed, so our lab studies kind of really funky reefs that kind of live in weird places. Um, so uh, the left-hand picture is in Japan. This is the Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary in the Gulf of Mexico. So you may not think corals live in Texas, but they do. Um, and then on the far right, that's the plow site. Um, and in each of these sites, they're all really special because they house these kind of resilient coral populations. But even in these, in these neat places, we still see devastation. So they're still bleaching, we still get disease, and we still see um, really hot episodes uh, taking out corals that we consider to be the most resilient. So what is being done? Next. Okay, so um, coral restoration is a really hot buzzword right now, and there's a lot of effort and time being poured into this and resources. Um, so one effort is taking is fragmentation. So this is a Caribbean coral species that's uh, pretty close to extinction, um, and researchers are getting as many genotypes, so that just means individuals, they're putting them in uh, tanks and fragmenting them up and then outplanting them to reefs and then like crossing their fingers and hoping they survive. Um, and then there's also sexual propagation where we kind of collect gametes or eggs and sperm from the field and like help them reproduce. So when there's not that many individuals, they might not be able to find a partner. And then there are also captive breeding programs where they're breeding corals in the lab. 
Um, and all of this is being under, done kind of under the mountain of the Coral Restoration Consortium, and our lab is specifically part of the genetics working group. So we're trying to provide genetic information uh, for these restoration managers. So when we think about um, whether corals will persist, we always get this question, oh, are corals doomed? And I always say, like, the world is warming. So when we think about what this is going to look like, I think there's still going to be corals, but I think the world that we live in is going to look really different, and so will reefs. Round of applause for Sarah Davis, Hannah Ackerman, the doctors. We've had the Davis Marine Lab featured in a number of multiverse concerts, and it's such a joy to see them every time and get an update from the reef, more than once a year, actually. From the deep ocean to deep space. like to welcome our next speaker to the stage, Dr. Peter Garrison of the Black Hole Initiative. Round of applause. Thank you, Peter. So it's a long way from the depths of the ocean to the far reaches of the sky, but they're actually more connected than you might think. When we look around us or breathe in and breathe out, we see the fragments of the whole history of the universe. We gain our hydrogen from the Big Bang. Our carbon and our nitrogen come from the dying of smallish stars. Our oxygen comes from the explosion of huge stars. Gold that you might have or that exists in the world is created when neutron stars collapsed, giant nu nuclei crash into each other in deep space. Neutron stars also, if they're big enough, can collapse into black holes. And those black holes can then coalesce into bigger and bigger black holes until you get these supermassive ones, like the picture behind me, the image of Messier 87, a huge galaxy in the sky that harbors a supermassive black hole 6.5 billion times the mass of the sun. If its center was the su at the center of our solar system, it would extend far beyond the edge of our solar system far beyond Pluto. Each of the 100 billion or so galaxies in the visible universe has one of these enormous black holes at its center. They're hugely paradoxical objects. They're the darkest of all objects. They emit no light. They reflect no light. We only know them by the surrounding hot plasma that circulates around them and the effects that they have on the stars that circulate around them. It's really an astonishing accomplishment to be able to see what was entirely speculative even a generation ago when I was in, in college. One of my professors, a, a terrific Nobel Prize winning physicist, didn't believe that black holes were real. And here we now know that they're central to the formation of galaxies to so much of the world we see around us. In fact, as I say, these are the darkest of objects, but they also, when they're spinning, and, the, some, and many of them do spin, they can shoot out jets of material that can clear areas of star-forming materials and, and create other zones of stars coalescing. So they shape the world around us, and they are those beams of light can cover the distance of many galaxies. So these are some of the brightest objects and the darkest objects, the simplest objects, the most complex objects that we know. These are objects that really represent 
in many ways, one of the great mysteries of the world around us. And that through our collaboration, uh, for instance, the collaboration, the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration uh, that I've been working with now for seven or eight years, uh, making that picture took 200 people all around the world, many different observatories, many different specialties, uh, all working together in the kind of collaborative venture that I hope we'll more and more see to combat climate change in the world around us right here on Earth. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. Global collaboration to discover the universe and to safeguard the Earth that we sometimes take for granted but really never should. Back to In Stile Moderno.
Huge round of applause for Instile Moderno. That was Laudate Dominum by Claudio Monteverdi. We are ready to move from the deep oceans to the skies and back to the earth. Uh, in just one town over, I'm going to welcome our last speaker, uh, Stephen Nutter of Green Cambridge. Let's have a round of applause for Stephen. I'm glad you're all here today. I just want to say, you know, that hope is in, our, in your hands and hope is in our collective hands. I'm Stephen Nutter. I'm the executive director of Green Cambridge. We're an environmental organization focused on Cambridge and in partnering with our ecosystem of regional friends. Um, next slide. Um, I'm so happy to be here, here with you today and so happy that you came out, so happy that we can see hope. Um, because without hope, it's hard to really do anything. And there is so much that needs to be done. Um, we know that a regenerative climate a justice future will come from all of us. We hear a lot about new climate-friendly technologies like electric cars and freight farms and incredible new solar panels and devices like composting on your kitchen countertop, which is really cool. These are amazing te te technical mitigations to repair our climate crisis. Next slide. But we also know that people are, are integral to this ecosystem and that uh, that is a complete and whole system where we can find happiness, solstice, uh, and hope by putting our hands in the soil with others in the community. So I'd like to share with you one of our new programs called Canopy Crew. We're at a tipping point in our urban areas. We need more trees or face a hot and flooded future. And Canopy Crew trains youth in a nine-month paid internship in science, outreach, policy, and planting. Because we know now and in the future, we need urban arborists, we need ecologists, we need policymakers to help regenerate and repair the earth and our society. Next slide. Uh, we focus on trees because there are real benefits to urban trees. As you've life likely experienced, it's very comfortable when you're underneath of a tree and on a hot day in the city. Uh, they also create habitat and they mitigate stormwater. Uh, so many good things come from, come from urban trees. Some studies have even shown that they reduce crime. Next slide. Cambridge has been really, uh, it's really interesting to, to work in Cambridge because uh, in 2019, we put out a brand new uh, urban forest master plan, which is like 600 pages long. It's incredible. Um, one of the few cities who has this plan, Boston has one, by the way. Um, we've lost, so in, in that urban forest master plan, we found that uh, we've lost 86 soccer fields worth of tree canopy. That's about 15% of the overall canopy, just in the course of just a little more than a decade. And it's really similar to other places, Nashville, Rochester, Boston, Somerville. Um, next slide. So we also found that 80% of the tree canopy is on private property. So the city's not necessarily going to be able to you know, plant there. They can't plant on private property. They, can't, they, can, they can plant in parks. They can plant on the sidewalks. And they can plant at your schools. Uh, but they can't plant in backyards. And that's where most of the tree canopy is. And that's where Green Cambridge comes in. Next slide. So we also found that uh, in the Urban Forest Master Plan that most of the canopy loss and the lowest amount of canopy is, is, is in our environmental justice areas. And that aligns with their other environmental issues that, they're, that those populations and communities are facing. Next slide. So through a GIS analysis, we found that at least 3,200 spots in Cambridge uh, for trees on private property. Uh, so Canopy Crew hopes to plant on every single one in the next 10 years. We found places all over the city to plant, uh, but our focus is going to be in the areas of East Cambridge, Wellington, Harrington, and the port. And in the next couple of years, this is a, the GIS map, um, each one of those green dots is a, is a, is a place to plant. Um, over, the next, over the next few years, we're gonna have uh, our own tree nursery. Next slide. On top of a parking garage, uh, a new development uh, called IQHQ Alewife Park. 
Uh, IQHQ has been really uh, a great partner to work with. Um, they're, they're building this, this new development. They, they put, it, put it in the park, uh, put in the, the parking garage, and, and we went to them and said, can we have a tree nursery on top of your parking garage? So that's gonna be run by the canopy crew as well. And it'll really provide us a pipeline of young trees uh, to plant in all over the city of Cambridge. Um, and we see hope in the future when we come together and we put our hands in the soil with other people in the community. Next slide. And I just wanna thank you. You can find more information at greencambridge.org. Stephen Nutter of Green Cambridge. We're proud to have collaborated and played with their organization a, a number of times and well, we all just need more trees uh, in our surroundings they bring joy to me uh, and the kids so we are at our last piece on the program and uh, we want this is a bit of a tall order because we wanted to do a piece that really tried to bring together these threads because uh, hopefully we've We've all been thinking over this Earth Week that climate change, uh, climate change affects every sector of society. It affects all of us. Um, and the solutions come at so many different levels from local, regional, national, and, and international. We need to find a consensus to move forward. And bringing people together has got to be the start. Uh, so this piece, Mantra, brings together some of the voices that you will have heard uh, previously. Uh, in today's performance. And gradually, uh, we look for a consensus. It was a tall order to find one. Uh, I would say that emotionally, we all want uh, a better Earth. And the, as you can see from our speakers, the, the plans of action are there. And we just have to put them together and move forward. So this is Mantra. Hot city in the summer, can't think it's so hot. How are our babies and our elders doing? How do we all cool off? It's scary to think that my daughter may not have a steady climate. Uh, I feel you know, hopeful that storms, the next generation uh, of students and scientists and is passionate and prepared to deal with climate Since change. having kids, I've thought a lot more about climate change. As a mother of two young kids, I feel obligated to push for a better future for this nature. Today can experience the
That's our show. Okay. <laughs> Up to the stage, everybody. We've got a lot of people to thank. So um, we'll, we'll start with the musicians. We've got our solo cellist, Mike Block. Round of applause for Mike. <laughs> Agnes Kopnikox, Nathaniel Cox of Instile Moderno. Visuals by Nuzu Wong. Take a bow, Nuzu. She's in the back there. And I'm David Ibbert, a composer of the music and director of Multiverse Concert Series. Now, our speakers, who all deserve to have their projects fully funded and supported in every conceivable way, are, let's go from left to right. We've got Hannah Eichenberg and Sarah Davis, BU Me Marine Biology. <laughs> Patricia Spencer, the Urban Farming Institute. <laughs> Peter Gallison, the Black Hole Initiative. And Stephen Nutter, Green Cambridge. <laughs> Um, we want to thank uh, uh, Falsetti Pianos, who provided this piano, uh, Massachusetts Cultural Council, and our amazing Kickstarter backers that backed this project and made it a reality. We also want to thank uh, Amy McDonald, uh, the WBR City Space, and their tech team. Round of applause for them. And all together. <laughs> we have got a little tiny encore. Do you, want, do you want to hear it? Yeah. Do you want to hear it? Okay, well, uh, our speakers, uh, in a minute you'll get to uh, chat with them and, and learn more about their projects. They're really keen to tell you. Uh, um, just before then, this, uh, this last piece is called Generation, and uh, me and Mike are going to play it for you, acoustic style. Um, and there'll be some action items uh, on the screen, because Earth Week, we all have to think about what we can do. Um, they are, this, it's a, it's a, a list of things, and they're all things that you can do in your own life uh, to take this idea of sustainability and regeneration, which means giving back to the earth rather than staying kind of neutral. Uh, we have to give back. And uh, the Ibbot household switched to uh, green electricity uh, entirely this year, I'm pleased to say. Uh, so that's one of the things. No, 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 it's not enough. Uh, <laughs> there are plenty of things. So have a look at this list while we play Generation. Thank you. <laughs> 